Hello and welcome to this video for Comp 6259 Advanced Games Design at the University of Southampton. My name's David Millard, I'm one of the lecturers on the course. In this video we're going to be talking about locative games, sometimes called mixed reality games. In this first video we're going to be looking at the definition of mixed reality games themselves, my own personal background with that field, we're going to be looking at some of the kind of key mechanics, and then in later videos we're going to be looking at some of the navigational structures that work within mixed reality games and locative situations, and also the poetics, how you design them for those different contexts and different environments. So let's start thinking about some of those terms. So I've already used one that's uh, one of my favourites, which is mixed reality games. It's a nice general term, um, but sometimes you hear the phrase augmented reality games or hybrid reality games or even extended reality games. The key thing is, is that they are games played on a smartphone in a real environment where element of the, elements of the game are, are kind of linked with the, the real environment. Now, if those games have a particular narrative feel, sometimes those are described as locative literature. I've also heard the words uh, ambient literature used for that, perhaps in the sort of digital media space. But essentially, they all have the same feature. You're navigating a physical environment, but at the same time, interacting with a digital space and therefore playing a game. I first came to this area back in the early 2000s. I was involved as a research fellow on a project called Chawton House, which ran, I think, from 2003 to 2006. Now, Chawton House is a manor house in Hampshire, and we had a, a project that was looking at developing a mixed reality game for school children to explore the grounds of the house. Back in the 2000s, the technology was, was obviously much less developed, so we didn't have mobile data connectivity, so we had to create these sort of Wi-Fi boxes that we put up in the trees with uh, battery packs. And of course, we didn't have smartphones, and we were still a few, few years away from the launch of the iPhone. So we had PDAs, and we literally duct tape uh, GPS receivers to the back of them and link them together over a serial connection. So a uh, very different environment, much more difficult to, to construct, uh, but the principle was the same children would explore the house, uh, they would find digital material in the environment, and they would get prompted to do different tasks and different learning activities. We were certainly not the first people to do mixed reality games, and we weren't the last. So over the next 10 years, we saw a, a real increase in the number of academic papers and academic groups exploring this idea of, of locative games or mixed reality games. So I've brought some of my favourite examples here. Things like Riot, which was developed by the University of York, but actually was in Queen Square in Bristol. Um, this was a sort of a virtual play that you listened to on, on headphones, but unfolded in the space around you. And as you moved around the square, you could listen to different events as they occurred, or you could move to different parts of the square to hear how different things, or you could follow characters around. Um, in contrast, the island of Madeira is more of an interactive tour. So in this system, uh, you have a, a smartphone, you're exploring the back streets of Funchal, you're looking for these QR markers or image markers that are placed in the environment around you, and you are learning about the story of the island um, and, uh, and its peoples. Uh, Viking Ghost Hunt, which was created by Trinity College Dublin in 2013, um, that's a, a more exploratory game where you move to different areas of the city to, to discover uh, ghosts. Um, you use a tracker on the phone to find the ghost in the real environment, and when you get to that place, the ghost appears and you have a kind of interactive um, conversation and you learn about the story of that ghost and what happened to that person before death. So it was around the kind of early 2010s, I suppose, that we started to see these games appear in things like the App Store and the Play Store, and they started to become a bit more popular in a commercial sense. And one of the first games that I became aware of in that space was Zombies Run by Six to Start. That was in 2012. So this is an audio game. You listen to it where you're going out from your run in the morning. Um, and essentially, uh, on your jog, you are pursued by ravenous zombies. Um, and there are different stories that you, you, will, uh, you will follow as you run. Um, and the, the game will respond to, to where you are and what you're doing. And it will give you prompts. And essentially, it gives you a kind of an interactive experience when you're exercising. Locative games are kind of interesting because they are simultaneously a bit of a niche market, but also include some of the very biggest mobile games in the world. If you take something like Nanantic's Pokemon Go, for example, that's generated over $5 billion of revenue uh, since 2016. So there's obviously an appetite out there for locative games and locative uh, experiences. People increasingly have the technology in their pockets that enable them to experience them and enable them to uh, 
to uh, um, do them without having to invest in, in expensive uh, extra technology. And there's also a lot of interest from uh, people like uh, cultural heritage institutions about how they can use mixed reality games and locative games to help people have new and uh, new experiences and explore cultural heritage sites in different ways. As you might expect for games that are set in a physical environment, navigation and movement is probably the most important mechanic to think about in mixed reality games. We can think about this in terms of two different types. We have um, hard movement, that's where the player must physically move in the environment to, to, trigger, eff to trigger effects or to, to get certain mechanical actions to occur. But they can also have soft movement, so that's when the player moves within the virtual realm on their, on their device. Perhaps they can um, send out a familiar or they can uh, pretend to be in an alternative place. In terms of hard movement, there's a number of technologies that are typically used. Probably uh, the most popular would be a GPS, Global Positioning System. Um, it's universally available pretty much, and it's pretty accurate. Um, you can use it in a coarse-grained way, meaning as a way to, to people to understand their context and understand where they are in the broadest sense. So, for example, you can position people on an outdoor map very well, but you can also use it in a more fine-grade sense. So, for example, providing a radar or a direction system which guides people towards a particular location. You can also use images. Those might be markers, those are things like QR codes or specific symbols that the image recognition system has been trained on. Or you could also use markerless systems. These would look at images or shapes that are in the environment in order to make this work. Finally, you could use various signals technology. Um, these are sometimes used in the form of, of beacons. So you have a system that is looking for ultrasonic uh, signals, for example. And again, in a coarse-grained way, you can use that uh, with multiple beacons to position people on a map. Or with single beacons, you can use that for a sort of hot and cold system to detect how close you are to the source. You can also use um, signals in the forms of near-field communication. So, for example, using a device to read RFID tags to, uh, to trigger when you've reached a particular point. So these latter technologies, images and signals and so on, they tend to be better for an indoor setting where GPS is not available and not accurate. But in an outdoor setting, uh, GPS is, uh, is typically pretty good. It's only if you want really fine-grained control that you go to one of these other technologies. After navigation and movement, probably the most common mechanic is information discovery. This is effectively what narrative games are doing, or locative literature, where the information discovery in there is in the form of uh, kind of narrative elements. But you can use them in, uh, you can use this mechanic in other types of games, for example, uh, for revealing learning objectives in serious games, or looking for clues in a kind of a mystery game. The information might be in all sorts of different multimedia forms, so it could be text or audio. You also have a video. That video might be volumetric, so it might itself be 3D, as shown here on the right-hand side, or it might be animations occurring in, for example, augmented reality. So very often information discovery is linked to a collection dynamic, so treasure hunts are very common for mixed reality games, and as I said, they're also linked to this sort of narrative and dramatic dynamic as well. As an example, consider the Spirit Project uh, down here on the right-hand side. This uses um, GPS for coarse-grained uh, navigation on a map, but it uses an image recognition system uh, for fine-grained navigation. So essentially, you have a, a tablet device, it shows you an image on the device, and you have to lift the tablet up and match that up, um, overlay it with the image of the real world behind. And when you do, it triggers an AR video that plays in location. And in this case, it tells the story of a Roman fort that's being invaded by some of the local barbarians. Because you are physically located in the space, another mechanic that seems a natural fit for mixed reality games would be mechanics based around territory. And in particular, things like territorial control, as is the case with a game like Ingress, or territorial completion, as is the case with a game like Strut. So in territorial control, a you or a, a team of people uh, that you're a part of try to take control of particular um, places um, and the team that has control of the most space is the one that's winning. In territorial completion, the idea is that you're gradually filling in a map, so it's a sort of a type of collection game or a collection dynamic as well. Now these games tend to use this mechanic in two different ways. So one is the idea of capturing vertices or corners. So in Ingress, for example, you're looking to build up um, 
points of interest and when you have a collection of three that form a triangle you gain control of that space um, but you also have um, systems where the, the the space is divided up into into specific areas so in strut you're actually filling in tiles on a map mixed reality games also can't resist the temptation to bring combat into their mechanics this might be something like Falcon Gunner, which is a sort of augmented reality-based shooter game. Uh, you hold your phone up and try and blast TIE fighters out of the sky as they come down towards you. It also might be more situated combat, so things like uh, Pokemon, where when you encounter other players you might engage in dueling, or you might have collaborative um, uh, activities, for example, uh, getting together with friends on a raid battle. Very often combat is linked to training, which is a sort of separate uh, mechanic, where you move up through levels or you get badges and achievements um, as you defeat uh, different entities. Because people are in a shared game world, you know, we're all in one physical space playing these games, it also encourages social play and that can be also an important part of these types of games. So these include things like having public player statistics so other people can see how you you're doing. It might be time-based events that are shared across multiple people. It might be about the co-construction of things in the environment or giving you sort of altruistic actions where you can greet people or, or send them gifts or um, do, other, uh, do other things for them. Um, invites um, in terms of making connections between people, collective action, you know, getting together to make certain achievements. And also, of course, um, a way of raising revenue is to enable you to to pay in a particular store to get sort of game advantages. So this maps onto a game like Pokemon Go quite well. So public player statistics, well that's your player profile and of course the visible pets that you have with you. Time-based events occur in Pokemon Go through the Team Go rocket balloons that appear in the environment. Um, you can gift other people, you can make friends with them. The collective action would be an example of, you know, raiding would be an example of that. And pur purchasable game advantages would be things like incense, for example, where you can attract additional Pokemon to your current location. So that's a, a quick whistle-stop tour of the sorts of technologies that are used in MR games and the sort of mechanics that are typical. In the next video, we're going to look at the first one of those mechanics in a bit more detail because it's so critical. So we're going to have a look at navigation and movement. See you in the next video.